who won't work too hard tonight. How's that sound? Okay. So this section's on part of speech tagging. So we spent a lot of time talking about garbage in, garbage out, and I feel like the lectures here are very timely um, in thinking about um, data cleaning. So we recently, our depart our program um, had a, a meeting with a bunch of people out in that work for businesses, that work for healthcare providers, that run consulting data analytics firms, and they're just, you know, hey, what's the things that people should be able to do to get hired? Like, what are, what are analysts doing nowadays? And I feel like I could have, um, could have sang their song, right? Because a lot of it was about data cleaning, that you spent so much time doing data cleaning and making sure people understand that. And I was like, justified, right? Um, and that's true. I think a lot of what people are trying to do right now, given the current world situation, is make all these graphs and these pictures, and these charts. And was reading, my partner was reading me this story earlier that was like, if you're going to go out and run, you should stay 66 feet away from people. And I was like, based on what? And they're like, oh, this simulation. And I was like, I'm going to roll my eyes so hard. So I think thinking about the types of data and how they process their data from last week um, has been very relevant. In our, it's always relevant, but I'm even more so now. Okay, let me see. What was your comment here? Uh, 502 error. I don't know if I know what that is. Um, let's see. So, like it just won't load for you, or when you get here, it does something? Because I'm not sure if I remember what that error is. Bad gateway. Hmm. All right. Um. Oh. Yeah. That might. Mm, mm, that might be a couple different things. Looking at like uh, I've got this on the other screen and I've googled it. If you will send me that markdown document, I have some ideas. On what that might be yeah but I don't think I can um, easily troubleshoot that without your markdown document yeah and I'll upload it into mine and see if I can figure out what it is or I can log in as you I guess just go ahead and send it to me because otherwise I'm not gonna remember because by the time I'm done with class I'm a zombie <laughs> so I'll uh, look at it tomorrow morning for you because I have a class right after this one too sure but I'm happy to help you fix it Okay, so we're going to do part of speech tagging now that I've got on my like soliloquy about um, data cleaning. And so part of speech tagging is like, if someone asks you like, what is traditional NLP? This is the thing that comes up. Everyone will mention part of speech tagging. Okay. Um, so what we've established so far is that text is very messy and it requires a lot of work to clean up. I honestly think that in every one of my projects, text-based or not, I probably spend more time data cleaning than I do the analyses. And the only time that that flips is when we decide to run 10 different versions of the analysis. And so uh, knowing that I have at least accurate data is super useful. In text, that's even more important, at least knowing what kind of data you have. So if you didn't spell check it, that's okay, but people should know that. And there's no one set of steps. So sometimes I do one set, one time I do another. I just wanted to give you in that lecture a, a list of all the possible things that you could do. Okay. And now that we know how to process raw text, what we can do is now start using um, regular expression and machine learning techniques to label text. So there's just sort of a, a line here where everything we've done up to this point has really been a little bit of learning coding and a little bit of thinking about the input to the data Everything we're doing here on out is a special type of classification. Okay. So part of speech tagging, dependency parsing, named entity recognition, we have a chapter called classification, and sentiment analysis are all special versions of a classification problem. Okay. So NLP really is just like a giant classification question. Um, and the first one being part of speech tagging. Um, very traditional 
very important, super useful for feeding into other analyses. So let's just talk a little bit about like what are sentences. So syntax is a set of rules. I'm gonna use syntax and grammar a little bit interchangeably, much to the chagrin of my linguistics professor, but for our purposes, um, the distinction between them is not really useful. Um, so we can think about this as grammar as well, but syntax is technically a set of rules that we have that allows us to put words together that create well-formed sentences. Okay. And when we say well-formed here, what we mean is that people would consider them grammatically correct, and that allows us to translate um, from words, physical words on the page, into meaning. Okay. Because the real um, important part, right, is semantics, understanding what's going on, but that arises from having a correct, a well-formed, grammatically correct, syntactically correct sentence, okay? or cause or phrase, whatever. Um, so that's why a lot of humor or a lot of um, slang can be difficult for people to process um, because it plays on these ideas of syntax. Um, additionally, if you're a second language speaker, this can be hard to understand too because you're expecting a certain set of rules. Like the easiest rule is word order is important. Okay? And that's true for nearly every language. Most languages follow some version of subject, verb, object, okay? or subject, object, verb. Um, and that order determines who's doing the action, who's being acted upon. Okay? So we'll use that to our advantage um, in a couple weeks when we do parsing. So what we can have is words. Words build up into phrases. Um, phrases can be built up into clauses. Uh, not, in our, for our purposes, not too helpful, the distinction between a phrase and a clause, but all of that can be built into a sentence. Sentences build in paragraphs. Paragraphs are technically considered discourse. A whole bunch of discourse would be a corpus. And so remember, we're going to use a lot of words that mean approximately the same thing, but constituent is an important one here. And a constituent is a member of the current set you're examining. So words are constituents of phrases and sentences. But phrases are members of those sentences, whereas sentences are members of paragraphs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, constituent is usually used as a term to mean the level that you're processing at. So for part of speech tagging, the constituent is usually the word because words get labeled parts of speech. When we get into parsing in a couple weeks, the constituent is usually the phrase, okay, then into the words. So one of our most important rules is word order. If you scramble the words in a sentence, the meaning will be lost. And you'll see this with um, some types of uh, learning Disability, I don't, I don't want to call it a disability, learning issues, right? There are some, um, some uh, genetic functions that if they're, they're broken, I'm thinking of Fox B2, you lose some of the ability to put sentences together well. Um, you see this in schizophrenia um, and aphasias, right? So if you break part of your brain, right? So we know it's at least a little bit genetic, um, but, you know, if I'm trying to write a computer program, I certainly am very concerned about word order because that is how people will parse and interpret the sentence. But it's not our only rule that we have. So, a very famous sentence from Chomsky is colorless green ideas sleep furiously. Okay. This is a well-formed sentence, adjective, adjective, noun, verb, adverb. Okay, that is per grammatically correct. But um, semantically, understanding the meaning of the sentence, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Now, I've heard this sentence like eight bazillion times, so it means something to me because it's not Chomsky's famous sentence, right? But if I think about what if I tried to like create a mental image of this um, sentence, it wouldn't make sense because something can't be colorless and green. Um, but word order does give us the most clues on how to process or what's called parse a sentence. So when you are 
reading or uh, listening, that's technically considered parsing. You're taking in information and processing it. So the words themselves, since we're working with part of speech tagging, we want to focus at the level of the word. Okay, so what is a word? Well, it's the smallest unit of independent language with meaning. And I think there's an important distinction here between words and morphemes. We very briefly talked about morphemes. So morphemes are the smallest unit of meaning. However, they're not always independent. Okay. So for example, cat is a word and a morpheme. And so it's the smallest unit of meaning. Um, and the morpheme is a single cat. Cats is a single uh, unit of meaning for, it's a word, but it's two morphemes. Because we have the smallest unit of meaning in, this, in cats is cat singular. They're, okay, I know what that looks like. Ours is being a jerk this week. Okay. And then the S, meaning there's more than one. So morphemes are the words, them, the root word plus all of the affixes that are possible, whereas the word itself is the entire kind of unit. Right, so cat and cats are both words. We're going to focus right now on the words, but morphemes give us a lot of clues on what type of word it is for part of speech tagging. So what are some common parts of speech? Okay. Well, the most common part of speech is a noun. Okay. And these are words that depict objects or entities, but they can also be abstract, like truth is a noun. Um, and when I say they're the most common part of speech, I mean like we literally have more nouns than anything else in every language. And the, <clears throat> excuse me, the cool part about um, about that fact is when we get into building our own taggers next week, what we'll see is that if we don't know, we can just guess noun and be right a good chunk of the time. Okay. Second most common part of speech are verbs. Okay, these are words that depict some sort of action or state or an occurrence. Um, so actions like physically doing something, states like emotion, thinking, or occurrences, time, time tied to things. <clears throat> adjectives are words that qualify nouns, so colorless is a, an adjective. And adverbs are words that qualify verbs. So sleeping furiously, if one can do that. And these are the big four. Um, so the four most common parts of speech. Now, they're not the most frequently used pieces, um, but if I took all of the words like in English, these would be the most four most common. Okay. The most commonly used types of words are determinants and prepositions, more than likely, um, but they have a limited number of those. So you can learn a whole lot more on parts of speech. There are more parts of speech than you would realize. Most people can usually name about six of them. There's 10 in the universal tag set, um, but some tag sets, which we'll learn about here in a minute, are up to 50 or 60 of them. So there are lots of parts of speech. You can get very fine grained with your tagging. So let me show you a real quick example. So this is a Python chunk. So I've loaded reticulate earlier. I've opened up Spacey and Pandas. And remember that when we load Spacey, what we want to do is essentially activate its capabilities and tell it what language we want to activate that in. So we'll do Spacey.load and then do in core web small. So this is start the English language module. Now when I wrote these notes a while back, there was a scandal going on da, 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 of um, a professor who exercised his First Amendment rights to say something that a lot of people weren't too happy about. And this happens probably about once a month. Various calls for people who say things that they shouldn't. So this sentence here is from an article that I was reading about that this incident, this incident where this male professor says something very sexist. Um, 
And they basically said, well, we can't really fire him for saying stuff we don't like because First Amendment, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I took this sentence because it's extraordinarily complex. We cannot, nor would we, fire this person for his post as a private citizen. As vile and stupid as they are because the First Amendment of the United States forbids us to do so, she wrote in the letter, blah. This is one giant sentence with about 12 clauses. So I think it's a good one to show you as a, a complex example of part of speech tagging. And it also gets it wrong several times. So I think we can, we can really talk about the limitations of these taggers too. Okay. So to tag in Spacey, what you have to do is loop over the words which is a pretty common tag issue here. But what I'm gonna do is I can run my NLP on the sentence. Okay, that will give me back tons of information. But if I wanna get those tags back out and do something useful with them, what I have to do is loop over it. So this here in the parentheses is what's called a tuple. And so we're gonna to try to start adding some to our Python language here. Tuples, while it kind of sounds like two pull, it has nothing to do with the number two, spelled T-U-P-L-E, okay. are immutable objects in Python. What that means is once they're created, you can erase them, but you cannot edit them. Okay. So um, that's a, it's useful and it's not sometimes, but for our purposes, they're little like clustered sets. Okay. So we're looping over the words in each of the um, in the NLP sentence. Okay. And what do I want back? Well, I want a tuple set that's the word, the tag, so it's part of speech tag. Okay. Well, it's tag, it's like descriptor tag, and then it's part of speech tag. Okay. Um, and the difference here is just uh, the way it's labeled. So there's two different um, tag labeling systems. It, they mean the same thing, but the uh, second one's a little easier to read. And so this here is a tuple. Okay, so give me this three co part combination back for every word in my sentence. Okay. The square brackets here mean give me a list in Python, which remember we talked about being essentially like one column of data in R. But the nice thing about saving it in this like um, three part format is that I can turn that into a data frame. The dot T here means transpose, so that was in long format, was which, what I would call that, where each one was a line, but I transposed it so that we could see the sentence kind of how it would be written. Okay. Practically, if I was working with this, I would leave it in long format where I had like word, tag, and part of speech. <clears throat> but let's look at this. So we here is a pronoun. Okay. And so you can see this is just two different ways that we might see pronoun labeled. Can is what's sometimes called an auxiliary verb or sometimes called a modal verb. And that's why you get the two different ones there. Here, this is adverb, okay, punctuation, coordinating conjunction. Oh, infinitive is what this one usually is called, too. It's kind of a weird word. Um, the is a determinant, university noun, website noun, okay. um, and punctuation. So we just didn't see all the ones in the middle. And so the nice thing here is that we can take Spacey's output and turn it into a data frame, which is always useful. Now, phrases, especially in, in these, this crazy sentence, is one or more words. So a phrase can be one word. Okay? Clauses have to be multiple words. But a phrase can be a single noun. Uh, and they tend to fall into three or four categories. But the biggest one is the noun phrase. Noun phrases are where the noun is the head word. So we're going to talk about head words a lot. And that just means it's the first word in the phrase, the one that drives that phrase. So for it to be a noun phrase, it has to start with a noun. And that usually depicts the person who's doing the acting or the speaking in this sentence. And then if it's later in the sentence, it's the person who's being acted upon, which is called the actee. So if I said, I'm drinking my coffee, I is a noun phrase, okay, and I'm the actor. Um, coffee, my coffee, I guess would be, well, it's technically a noun phrase, um, where coffee is the thing being acted upon. 
Okay. A verb phrase is where the verb acts as the head word. Okay, drinking here, usually depicting the action, state, or occurrence in the sentence. Those two are going to be very important in a couple weeks when we do um, parsing. But obviously, to get to that point, to be able to do that type of parsing, we have to know which one's a noun and which one's a verb. So that's why this part of speech tagging section comes first. Those are the main two. We can also define what are called prepositional phrases. This is the next most common thing you'll see, where there's a preposition that modifies a previous phrase, like I'm drinking my coffee late at night, okay, um, or um, I can hear the boys playing outside because I can next door. Um, going up the stairs here is an example of a prepositional phrase. So those are usually a combination of a preposition and a noun phrase. And then we can also have adjectives and verb phrases where um, something like the cat is quick. Quick here is a whole phrase in itself um, with just an adjective that modifies a previous noun. All right, that is enough of that. So we'll cover phrases more in our entity recognition and dependency parsing sections. That is making my teeth feel funny. Too much coffee today. Ah! <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Cover those more later. Okay. First, we have to figure out how to um, how to know which one of those is a noun because once we figure out which ones are nouns, labeling phrases becomes much easier. That also, understanding these words and phrases, allows us to understand grammar and syntax. So those are those sets of rules that help us construct sentences. And pretty much if I tell you that most sentences are subject, verb, object, that means it's noun phrase, verb phrase, noun phrase. Okay, now I can understand the rules for putting together a logical sentence. Okay. All right, grammars though, <clears throat> What we'll do is um, learn how to do dependency grammar. We're going to do entity recognition first, but then we'll do dependency grammar. And this looks at the words in a sentence and focuses on their dependencies to each other. And that will allow you to do things like, like when you're searching, let's say I'm trying to find um, a what hotel is closest to the Ben Franklin Museum, right, in, in Philly. Um, that is a kind of dependency problem because we have to understand that we want close hotel located in, you know, next to, and so dependency grammars allow us to make these maps of how things are all related to each other. And that's usually a verb-focused problem because verbs are the driver of what is a dependency in a sentence usually because verbs often tell us what kinds of words are required in a sentence and that uses part of speech and word order to help us make those maps so I'm just trying to show you here like why is part of speech tagging so important well it's pretty much going to play into the rest of the semester okay. the other type of grammar we can build is called a constituency or phrase structure grammar um, this allows us to build hierarchical sentences. You'll see these in these little trees. Um, these are, are kind of the old guard, if you will. Um, dependency parsing is a lot more popular now, but <clears throat> uh, constituency grammar really helps us and allows us to think about complexity in a sentence. So my, um, my um, complex Twitter not Twitter, complex sentence that I showed you guys as the example is a sentence that has many clauses embedded within each other. So I could run and make a constituency chart or phrase tree structure and I would know without ever reading the sentence that it's probably way too complex. I wish I could do this on my on my students like theses projects. <laughs> this would be like have it like auto label these like terribly long sentences. 
and I have a, a former student who's getting his PhD in clinical psych who I am often like, if the sentence is more than three lines and word long, it's too long, <laughs> right? Because people can't keep track of what's going on. And you can use a constituency grammar to just create a score for that, essentially. And these are very structured um, tree diagram kinds of sentences, and then looks at the types of words that are in each phrase and breaks them down by phrase. And so we really still need to know what type of part of speech it is. And then uh, it also turns out that most dependency parsing is just a translation of a constituency grammar. So um, we'll look at those in a couple weeks. So there are many parts of speech. So we could label nouns as just a noun. We could label as a plural noun. We could label as a proper noun. Okay, be like named objects. Verbs can be labeled with their tense future, present, past. Um, <clears throat> conjunctions can be technically con con considered coordinating, subordinating, or just conjunctions. Conjunctions are words like button, and, etc. So the problem is labeling, you have to often pick what's called a tag set. Okay? So we have to define the level of specificity we want to work with. Now, personally, I think using the universal tag set where there's only 10 options is much easier to think about, but there are times when you want more specificity, more detail in your tags than not. Then that really also depends on the corpus. So some corpora are pre-labeled, so we can use them as training data sets. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I'll do that. We'll do that with the Brown data set next week. Um, and then sometimes, depending on what kind of tagger you have, so if your tagger has been trained on a very specific data set, you can get less specific. But if your tagger has been trained on the universal tag set, you probably can't get more specific. So it's better to train the taggers on specific level structure because you can always get, you know, less specific, but you can't get more. Um, and it depends on the training. Okay. And so these possible tags are often called tag sets, and some of them have names, right? the brown tag set, the pin tree bank tag set, the universal tag set. So um, within each of our functions that we'll use, we'll, I'll show you how to look up the tag set. And then there are often ways to switch between them. All right, so now let's get into the physical process of tagging before we start looking at some R code. Excuse me. So how do I tag a word? Like, I mean, I could just look it up in the dictionary. Okay, so I know that apple is a noun, right? Um, and that would be okay, because we have big dictionaries like WordNet and PinTreeBank. <clears throat> but that quickly becomes very inefficient. Okay? And then the problem is that that's very error prone. What do you do with words that have multiple parts of speech? Because in reality, most words are multiple parts of speech. Okay. Um, so like we'll use bank as an example of a word that has a lot of meanings, different meanings, but it could be a verb or a noun. Uh, we can use Google actually as a verb or a noun. Uh, the word that in the English language I think it can be 10 different parts of speech, depending on where you use it and how you use it. So a dictionary you look up only gets us so far, because then when there it has those multiple parts of speech, which one do you pick? Right, the most common one? It's not a bad guess, but it'll be wrong sometimes. Um, and why is this error prone? It's not even polysemy. Polysemy is really like multiple meanings. This is like multiple, I guess they're multiple meanings because each part of speech probably means something different. The problem is the many to many problem. There are many parts of speech, okay, and many meanings. Another thing I could use is what, uh, morphological cues <clears throat> where we could tell it to look up regular expressions, right? So anything that ends in um, a ED might be past tense. So a verb, anything that ends in ing might be the participle or the gerund tense. 
um, gerund's not really a tense, but verb, right? Uh, ly for adverbs. Okay? That might get us pretty far, um, but we'll miss a lot of things because not everything has a morphological cue for the word type. But then we can start combining these things and do even better. <clears throat> Sorry, I I hate Bradford pears with a passion of a thousand suns. Mostly because they give me a runny nose and they smell terrible. If you don't know what a Bradford pear is, <clears throat> to look them up, they smell like fish. Rotting fish. <laughs> um and I'm not really allergic to them, but when they start blooming, man, all this not, sorry. So I have a little bit of a pro, uh, drainage problem because there's like six of them <laughs> in our neighbor's yard. And every time we walk past them, I'm like, stupid trees. Right. Anyways, morphological cues, useful, not always the best. This still is very error prone because the words like morning are still nouns, even though they have the ing. So spelling is not a perfect indicator of Q um, in English. It is a better indicator of Q in other languages, but um, especially for verb conjugations that are particular, but it's still really messy. Well, then we can move into syntax, okay, looking at the words around it. So the noun probably is going to come first. So noun, verb, noun. It's not a bad plan either. Um, this, however, while probably one of the most accurate ways to do it is really slow because you have to parse and you have to build a system that can look at phrasal units and that you know even if I did like two words at a time would take a lot of training data and would be a particularly slow process so um, what you'll see is a lot of times this semester the like best systems require so much training data that like Google has, right, or Amazon, but maybe not as normal people, um, <clears throat> and would require a lot of training time. Okay. So um, there are, are good systems and then there are efficient systems. Uh, so this is more accurate, but will require a very large training course. The last way we can do this is semantic cues. So if we can figure out what the word means, we can probably assign it to a class. And that is likely the best system, right? But, the big but here, all of these have a but. Um, words have multiple meanings, and so because the, the words can be used in lots of different ways, um, without having a system that um, is intelligent reading and all, like well, having people essentially, it might be hard to sort on which meaning you intend. Okay. And then for computers, it figures out which meaning you intend by the part of speech. So that's a circular issue, right? You have to know the part of speech to get the meaning, but if we're trying to use the part of meaning to tag the part of speech, then we've left ourselves in a loop. So what do we do? Well, we would what we do is a combination of the first two okay, um, and some probabilistic theory. Okay? We can do syntactic clues as well if we had the right type of systems. So like Spacey is a system that has included syntactic clues. Um, but when we build our own, we can show you that you can get pretty far. Like you can make a very good tagger. Um, with just pure probability and um, some regular expressions. So we'll look at that. Okay. We're going to start by looking at automatic taggers. So automatic taggers are ones that have been pre-trained. They have a set of underlying rules. So some of these systems have been trained in your traditional machine learning sense, like Spacey is a complex neural um, it's a complex model, but it's been trained. It's a neural net system that um, has had a ton of data put into it. And you can look at their training data sets. Okay. Uh, we'll talk about how to do one of these training data sets, but then there are other algorithm style taggers that have been written to kind of use the combination of lookup rules and regular expressions. Okay. Those aren't really trained in the sense of like machine learning kind of training, but they have these like rules on how to how to best apply 
and make things work. So we're going to start um, with R and then um, move into NLTK as the long-standing traditional system where you can train your own taggers and then we'll get Spacey as the newer AI kind of systems. Um, and I, I feel like at some point NLTK will die <laughs> and we could just talk about Spacey, but I like to still teach people NLTK because it's, it's a package that has had a very large influence on this field and was pretty stunning when it came out. Um, they don't really maintain it anymore. I mean, it still runs, but it's not actively updated. Uh, Spacey is definitely one of the more one of the more state of the art free systems, right? In Python, there are other non-free systems, um, but I think it's a good contrast between the two. You can see kind of how the field has evolved over the years. All right. So technically, this is a machine learning problem. So I have two paths here. I can write a set of rules saying, here's a list of all the words I know, use a dictionary lookup and a regular expression, or I can train my tagger and make this a machine learning problem. It's just got a lot of classes. And when people talk about machine learning, they're generally talking about a limited number of classes, right? Uh, sentiment, positive, negative. Um, I don't even know, keyword tagging, like there's, usually like less than 20 things that you're trying to tag. Um, but in part of speech tagging, it could be up to like 50 some odd. So it helps if you have kind of a combination of these two things. And so here are some steps to any classification problem, because we're gonna do classification problems all the rest of the semester. Okay. First, clean up the data. Garbage in, garbage out. Data needs to be clean for us to, or as best we can do for, um, this to build because you have to know what you're working with but also for the outputs to make any sense some sort of feature right so we'll spend a lot of time on this in the last four weeks of class thinking about how do we take text qualitative stuff messy data and turn that into some sort of feature some sort of representation of the text numerically so we want to work at the word letter, word level, the letter level, census. Um, do we want to turn this into, into a numeric vector, a one-hot encoding vector, sometimes what binary data is called? Um, how do we, you know, we got to figure out what our features are. Okay. And then we have to extract those features. Now features here, it can be so many things. It can be the number of vowels. Okay, this is not a super common use for words, but maybe it could be the number of vowels. Um, it could be if it has an ing on it, yes or no. It could be the word itself, which is the most common thing, is the the encoding of the word. Uh, it could be a count of the total number of words. It could be a word to vec model, which we'll get to at the end of the semester as well. So feature extraction here is a a a usually an inspired choice. <laughs> depending on the task. So in our case, we're gonna work with words because that's what we're trying to do. Part of speech tagging, the feature itself is the word. Um, after that, you take some sort of training data, take our data set that has the answer in it, and we break that into a testing data set and a training data set. Um, and well, the key here is I'm talking about supervised learning. To know that we are part of speech tagging correctly, we have to have the answers. So right now I'm mostly talking about supervised learning tasks. Obviously there are unsupervised tasks like cluster analysis, topics modeling, where you don't have the answer. But for, what, for part of speech tagging, we need to have a data set that has the answer to know that we're getting it right. Otherwise you get a score by hand and that's just silly. Okay. And then we'll build some sort of model. There's some sort of machine learning algorithm in the background that allows us to build this classifier, part of speech tagger, chunker, parser, entity recognizer, etc. So clean data, that's a, got features extracted from it, split into training and testing, built into a model. This is what I like about Spacey is they have done a lot of that for me. And the when I load 
in Core Web Small, right? Uh, I am loading their model. Okay, that they have done all this too already. Then I could test the model. So that's how they prove to us that these models are worth using. And like, well, here's our accuracy. I think they have it like right on their homepage. Let's look. Now, Spacey, the people who make Spacey also run a couple of other paid programming things. Um, like Prodigy is one of them, right? So blah 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 blah. Um, they had a thing somewhere where they had ah, here it is down here, right? So they've got a measure of accuracy, okay? Um, here that is comparison to other pro popular programs. So this is written in Python, or sometimes it's called Cython because it runs also on um, C underneath to make it faster. They have, they're comparing themselves to Clear NLP and Core NLP, which are Java-based programs, um, and uh, Turbo, which is a C++ program, and then there are even more of these systems out there. They're just comparing themselves to what are considered the top programs, and they show that they can get accuracy better than anybody else. So I would say getting almost 93% is an amazing job because um, this is probably English, but because English is so such a slippery language, it has so many words that have multiple parts of speech and multiple um, part, uh, meanings. So this is a, actually a fairly tricky task. Okay, and they also show you about their speed. I don't know why the new one here. Let's see what it says. Oh, okay. Well, I think it's clear that they, uh, the Python version of this runs much faster. Okay. All right. So, uh, Spacey? Is Spacey easier? Hmm. <laughs> um, you can tell me in a couple weeks. So, I think if you're going to use Spacey's automatic encoding right so let me go back to their website real quick it's a great question let's look at models here if you're going to use their pre-programmed models i would say it's not terribly hard you load it you run it okay i think training like building your own spacey model can be We'll learn how to do it this semester. And it's not like it's like brain surgery, but it can be tricky because the um, requirements of the structure of the data are what's tricky. Getting the data in the right format. So again, back to cleaning the data, putting it in the right format, trickiest part okay, because of the way it wants you to do stuff. Now, if you use their pre-programmed model, oh yeah, that's, I mean, you just import Spacey, load the model, run it. And you're done. Now, obviously here, check out the languages that they have. This is mostly European languages, okay, in English. So if you want to do this in a, uh, you know, some of the languages that are spoken the most in the world, <laughs> right, because that doesn't include what I think are the mo two most co common, uh, Chinese and, um, Hindi, I think. Uh, yeah, not on their list. So you would have to learn how to train it yourself. Now, the cool thing is here that they do have models. Um, they do have language data sets for other languages. Okay. Um, but you would have to train it. So we'll look at how to do that. I'll teach you how to do that um, in small chunks. But that's the part that's a little bit harder, I think. <clears throat> Uh, I think they have Spanish. Yeah, they have Spanish. I was talking about languages they didn't have pre-built. So I hate that my answer is, is <laughs> it depends, mm, but it just kind of like depends on what you're trying to do. They, they do have a ton of code examples. Um, we're going to use some of them this semester um, where they teach you how to run their pipeline. So essentially what they are providing is a framework. 
uh, a neural net framework that you can use to train and build your own models, which is pretty cool. Okay, so automatic classifiers, though, let's start with R. Okay. So these taggers that we're going to look at um, either have a set of rules. Oh, okay, I forgot to turn that off. Hopefully it doesn't say anything too bad. Here we go. So they're either trained on a set of rules or um, a data set, an underlying data set. So let's say if it's been trained on a data set, one has to have a um, tagged corpus. So what are some examples of tagged corpora? Well, that includes the brown corpus is our most overused, but very handy corpus. Uh, the British national corpus, and then there are some other ones now um, that are newer that have tags on them. Um, it has to have some sort of feature set that's appropriate for the task. So the feature set here is probably the unit at the word level. Uh, the most common ways to build these feature sets include a bag of words method. Um, at the end of the semester, we'll talk a lot about bag of words, but the idea behind a bag of words method is where you take um, the data set that you're interested in, break it down into all of the word tokens, and then just count them up. Okay. So it's called a bag of words because you take it, you shake up the data set into a giant bag, and then just total them up. Okay. You ignore context. But you might think context is important. In part of speech tagging, it might really be important. So we might be interested in an ingram set, every pair of words, every triples of words, sentences, et cetera. Then we have to have some sort of algorithm. Okay, to build our model, um, that algorithm might be a default algorithm. And we're going to do um, defaults, regular expressions, and some of these other ones uh, next week. But we could have a default algorithm, which is essentially uh, make everything a noun. <laughs> we could use some regular expressions, uh, a hidden Markov model, or that were very popular for a long time for these. Um, naive Bayes is another algorithm. Uh, logistic regression doesn't tend to work terribly well here. Um, but uh, more probabilistic models tend to work better for parts of speech tagging because there are certain words that are more, certain word types that are more probable, nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs. But then there are certain tokens that are highly probable for a type. Okay. So it just really it depends. So probabilistic models tend to work better. Log is not one of those. So let's try some tagging in R. There are a variety of options for tagging in R. I don't have a good benchmark for their accuracy as compared to things like Spacey. I would say that Spacey is probably one of the most accurate things in English out there. Okay. Um, but these will often get you fairly close. And for what we'll look at, they're pretty much the same. Okay. Um, so many of these tend to kind of top out at about 90% because it's that last little bit of variability that's just very difficult to predict. So we're just going to look at a few of them. We're going to look at RDR, POS, Tagger, OpenNLP, and QDAP. And so these um, down here that we've installed are from GitHub but work really well. So this one, actually, these first three are all one tagger, the tagger package, but you have to install Termco and NLP setup first. So you have to install those in order. Um, let's see here. And then, um, yes, what about Spacey? There is a version of Spacey in R. Um, but what it does is it calls the Python version. So um, the short version of it is that basically it opens the Python version and it gives you the answer back. So you might as well learn how to use it in Python. It's kind of my feeling like, you know, there's a version of Keras in R as well, but what does it do? It opens Python, talks to Python, and then brings it back. It'll be a little bit faster if you do it in its native set. 
Like, I don't even know how, if I know how to use the spicy one in R because it's written in Python. <laughs> so, um, I think the nice thing about these wrappers though, that made that sound like you should never use a wrapper, which is totally wrong. But like, the nice thing about this is if you are only good at R and that's your like friendliest language, these are really nice because then, you know, you can use, um, use it without having to learn the Python. But since this semester we are using both, um, I think what you could do is if, okay, I can do this in Python. Well, if I want to use the R version, here's, you know, I already know what the uh, dot add function does. Here's how that's done in R. So you hopefully can make those kind of connections. Um, I haven't looked at this, but I imagine since it, opens Python and then comes back, it's got to be a little bit slower because it's adding an extra step in there. But I could be wrong. Um, yeah, and then this uh, recursive, or the RDR tagger, which I won't remember, get the, um, I'm going to confuse this with a different thing. So I'm going to just call it RDR until we can look at the full name. Now, many of the setups for taggers um, in R, at least, involve installing an external program we're not i'm not going to show you any of those but like me personally when i do this kind of thing i use a um the corpus package with a spell with a k um and tell it to talk to an external program the one i use is called tree tagger so the beauty of that is um it's fairly stable and it captures a lot of the quirky words um but if I have to do it again, I might use some of these newer packages because they tend to work just as well. They're way faster and the code is way easier. <laughs> the tree tagger package code options are not, is not easy. And setting it up is a pain, a big pain. So um, I'm recommending these packages because even though the R Java thing is a pain, it is not as big of a pain as Tree, <laughs> tree Tagger is. Okay. So let's look at just the Tagger package itself. Okay. So you do have to have R Java to get this one to work. I think that's unfortunate. There are several packages that um, across the semester that use the call Java for reasons I don't know. Um, I wish they didn't. It slows slows it down because it's calling another program, um, just practically. But um, also, I, f I think several of you probably figured out in the first week of class that setting up our job is a pain. I think I was talking to Kevin the um, Purcell, the uh, program director, one day, and he was just like, "Oh, our job." I was like, "I know, <laughs> it can suck. It sucks so hard." Um, anyway, that aside, um, but. The nice thing is, if you can get it set up, it is one of the easiest ones to use, okay? Because it uses OpenLLP to do the tagging. So I pulled over my sentence that we had before. We cannot, nor would we, blah, 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 fire this person for First Amendment rights. Okay? I loaded up the tagger, and I just told it to tag. And so what it does is it prints out the what's considered the traditional style. That traditional style is word and then the slash okay, uh, and then the tag. So you should, these should look familiar. Pronoun, modal, coordinating conjunction, modal, pro, pronoun, fire. Here's one I want to, I really want to highlight okay, um, across the, these taggers. Fire here is a, is a verb. Fire like to terminate. But if we look at the Google Translate, not Translate, sorry, Google, uh, Define for Fire, the most common <laughs> version, I didn't know I was going to get pictures this time, but the most common um, part of speech for Fire, the most probabilistic one, is a noun. Okay. Then it becomes a verb. And it's not even the most common interpretation of the verb. It's the name formal secondary interpretation for the verb. So, um, what we see here is that the tagger gets it wrong, but in a way that's not too surprising. Okay. So, we cannot, nor would we fire, blah, 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 blah. Okay. And so, that word is wrong. It's tagged incorrectly. 
And I want to show you something that it really depends on the input as well into the sentence. Okay. Whoa, too big. Nice. So let me load the lib uh, tagger library. And our sentence was, we can not fire professor person. Let's do that. Let's make the sentence easier. Okay. And now I've forgotten the function tag underscore part of speech. Now it gets it right. So we got um, pronoun, modal, adverb here, um, um, verb, noun, noun. Okay, give me just a second. There are is somebody clearly having a chat on Slack right now, and I'm in it, and they <laughs> constantly buzzing. So I'm gonna turn that off, so I'm not, it's not like buzz, buzz, buzz. Um, so notice here the difference. Before we have this embedded clause, we cannot nor would we fire professor person. So notice the capitalization is also what's giving this an NNP. So an NNP here is a proper noun. So let's see what that one does. Auto thing in R sometimes. Now it gets fire wrong. So by looking at those two things, I can deduce that part of what this tagger does is it's using those commas, those punctuation, to help it figure out where um, noun phrases start. Okay. So it's considering this a phrase, okay, and then this a phrase, okay, and then this is another phrase. So it's expecting here a noun, because we've seen can is technically a verb here. Um, it's a modal, a uh, special type of verb. But we've got noun, verb, okay, adverb, right? Um, then another kind of verb phrase. So it's really just expecting another noun phrase. And so it guesses, OK, well, the most common part of speech for fire is a noun. And this is after a comma, so it's probably a noun. Up here, what we see is that we have a noun phrase, the verb phrase, the full verb phrase, with a modifying modal on the on the verb, and then another noun phrase. So clearly, this kind of tagger, what it's doing, is a combination of of syntax, right, and probability, given its training. Uh, the last phrase having three nouns. Uh, no, it's uh, not super. You'll be surprised, I think, when we get into the parsing part on how complex noun phrases can be. They can be multiple, especially proper nouns. When you have a proper noun, right, it can be um, quite complex. It is a little uncommon um, to have. I would say having three nouns in a row, yes, can be a little uncommon. But because those two are proper nouns, that might be part of the problem. Now, you know, at the moment we're just tagging. So we're not trying to determine if things are grammatically correct. And so you have a really great question there. It's basically like, but why wouldn't it know? Um, that, that this one has to be the verb because otherwise it's not grammatically correct is what you're kind of asking. And I think you have a great point that'll lead into our parsing lecture. But right now that syntax is like, if this chunk, you know, what I've got is, I've already seen the verb. So this next chunk is probably noun. Um, and it doesn't really have to remember that the whole thing has to still work together. Yeah. So that is a great question. <clears throat> Yeah, university professor person. But university, I think in that sense, it will be tagged as a noun, but practically that technically should be an adjective, right? Um, but yeah, probabilistically three nouns in a row is a little weird, but it's not so weird that it's improbable. 
Um, okay, so purpose of, of using this sentence is that I love that the word fire doesn't get tagged correctly and I can show you the real limitations, but I would say that the tag is working about as well as one can assume, right? It's picking the most common part of speech. All right, now the reason I love tagger is because it comes with plotting functions and I'm a huge like make it a plot or die kind of person. <laughs> um, so I'm going to patch, uh, attach the plier here just to use a little pipe because uh, I like piping. So what we can do is tag our part of speech and then pipe it through the plot option. Okay, you could also just do plot and then tag part of speech, but the little piping thing tends to work, run a little bit faster. And now we can see our entire sentence at once. So this creates us a frequency histogram where this is the percent based on the number of words in the sentence down here. Um, and then the uh, most frequent to least frequent. So proper noun in here is an infinitive, I think about two. Uh, pronoun, regular noun, determinate, punctuation, which we should potentially take out. JJ for adjective, uh, past tense verb, um, two, see I don't remember what all of them mean. Modal, coordinated conjunction, more verbs, more verbs, verbs. So you kind of notice there's like six versions of verb here. So how do we solve that problem? Well, what the tagger package uses as a default are the pen tree bank tags. And so now we can see what these actually mean. And there are 45 of them. Um, so you thought there were like 10 parts of speech, but you're wrong. Okay, so let's look here. Okay, noun, proper noun, mm, Back up here, noun, proper noun, plural, proper noun, common plural nouns, the grief. In here is a preposition or conjunction uh, sub subordinating. It's not even infinitive. I had that wrong. Uh, to here is to the word as a preposition or infinitive marker. For verb, now we have verb, past tense verb, gerund verb, past participle, present tense, present tense, third person singular. So third person singular is I walk, you walk, they walk, he or she walks with an S. English is dumb sometimes. So that's a lot. 45 is just like a lot. So what can we do to make this easier? Well, we could use the universal tag set. Okay. So the universal tag set, and I can convert between them in this package by using as universal, is 10 parts of speech. And they're very simple. Noun, verb, adjective, adverb, pronoun, determinant, um, conjunctions, and prepositions. Okay, oh, and then the um, there's always a marker for punctuation. And the universal tag set also has a, an X for everything else, like interjections, that kind of thing. And so a lot of times I really like the universal set because now I can see that the most common thing in this, this sentence is nouns. So it almost gets the big four, right? Um, and so you can actually tell it, if I can get my computer to back up, uh, to print out the universal set too, so you can look at those. Uh, let's see here, how many slides are there for QDAP? I think there's only two. Okay, so we'll do QDAP and then we'll pause and save the RDR tagger and spacey for next class. Okay, so QDAP is a, um, qualitative data package. Uh, it's pretty popular for, what does it stand for? Bridging the gap between qualitative data and quantitative analysis. Okay. Um, pretty popular for um, these kinds of um, qualitative into numbers kinds of um, operations. And so the nice thing about QDAP is it doesn't require Java. It loads a bunch of stuff, blah, 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 stuff, stuff, stuff. Okay, so I'm trying to find the, I told, I should have told it quietly. Like, don't tell me all this crap, right? Uh, da, 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 let's get, okay. So to run the QDAP package, what you do is just run part of speech on your sentence. Okay. And it actually will give you a, like a um, progress bar if it's very large. And the reason I like QDAP um, is because it saves in this nice, like you can print.
print out these kind of um, pre-processed charts so you can look at the um, word count of our sentence so it's 46 words long which is crazy and then you can print out just the tags themselves you'll see that they look very familiar people tend to use the pen tree bank ones if they're going to use a complex set it's a very popular tag set um, notice that it also got fire wrong but also notice that it didn't return any punctuation maybe i'll do this a little differently but qdap will also very nicely give you this little uh, proportion chart so if I wanted to take those proportions and make my own pretty ggplot, I could. I can get that naturally from QDAP. Right. Right. Uh, and then I can also understand the tag set. So it's pretty similar. It's not as long as the pin tree bank, but it's honestly, it's the pin tree bank list without the punctuation is what it is okay. all right well maybe the adjectives are different but they were all fairly close to each other and once you looked at it, several of them um you'll start to recognize at least cc and then you know adjective as jj uh adverb as rv rb for usually okay. um, but i do love this one existential there <laughs> like why is that its own category like why did we need that whole thing all right, so we'll stop there and we'll leave the RDR tagger and the Python section for next time. So hang on to this sentence um, and kind of the, the issues we've already talked about with tagging and how taggers work.